Okay, uh, welcome back here. We're going to look at another uh, interval estimate on a population mean, but this time uh, slightly different from other exercises that we've done. Here we're going to be working with a very small sample, first of all, and uh, we are not making any assumptions about whether or not we know the population standard deviation. So this changes very little really. All it, all it changes is the distribution that we're going to be using. Instead of the standard normal distribution, uh, now we're going to be using what is called the T distribution or students T distribution, usually just the T distribution. Um, and the only other thing that we need to consider now is this thing called degrees of freedom which is related to our sample size. Now if our sample size is huge, um, over a hundred, let's say. So actually, it doesn't have to be that big. If it's over a hundred or pushing a thousand, um, that t distribution, for all practical purposes, it's exactly the same as the standard normal distribution. Statisticians, I'm sure, will disagree with me at some microscopic level, um, but a t distribution with a large sample size will look just like a standard normal distribution. Something like this, tall and skinny. As that t sample size gets smaller and smaller and smaller, uh, the t distribution changes shape, and it, so as as it gets smaller, the t distribution will get shorter and fatter, and so this of course changes the nature of the probabilities that that we get for any given um, test or any given uh, t value or the t value would be synonymous with a z value from a z distribution, so calculations are going to be the same, but using the distribution changes the process uh, a little bit more. So let's uh, let's just get into this exercise. So here we've got a very small sample. We have just six observations. Uh, and we ne now need to estimate two things, uh, sample mean and the sample standard deviation. So the sample mean, of course we've done this before, we add up all of the observations and divide it by the number of observations. And so here I can take something that sounds simple enough and I can make it look uh, complicated and tedious, but at this point, you know, I hope that everybody is becoming comfortable with this notation. Yes, I know it looks tedious, but it's the language of the course, it's the language of the subject matter, so it's good to get familiar using it. So here I'm going to add up all of our observations, 2 plus 6 plus 11 plus 5, 13 and 7, and divided by, I have n equals 6 observations, so we divide this by 6, and now we grab our calculator here. Oops. So 2 plus 6 plus 11 plus 5 plus 13 plus 7. And it's 44 divided by 6, and we have 7 and a third. So there's x bar is equal to 7 and a third. Now the next part of this exercise is calculating the standard deviation. Again, these you know, the notation makes it look more tedious than it is. Here we're we're adding up all of these squared deviations. So there's inside of the brackets, there's a deviation. We square it. We add all of those together. We divide by n minus 1, and we take the square root of that. If we didn't take the square root, that would be our sample variance. We want sample standard deviation, so we square root it. So what does that look like? Here we'll write all of this out. So our first observation, this is that 2 minus x bar, so 733 squared, plus our next observation, 6 minus 733 squared. And we do this for all six of these. Oops. and 7. So there's our numerator, there's all of our deviations squared and added up, and then we divide by n minus 1, 6 minus 1, and then we'll take the square root of all of that. So let's uh, get going on these calculations. So open brackets. 2 minus 7.33 squared plus 6 minus 7.33 squared plus 11 minus 7.33 
plus 5 minus 7.33 plus 13 minus 733 plus uh, I'm just going to move this over for that last one 7 minus 7.33 squared equals so there's our numerator is 81.33 so this is 81.33, divide that by 5, and square root it. So this divided by 5 is 16.27, square root that, and I have 4.03. So there's S is equal to 4.03. Good. Tedious, eh? Slow, but one of these necessary evils. There's a lot of calculations like that in statistics where we're adding up squared deviations. Good to get practice, and you'll always, you'll get plenty of practice in the course, I'm sure. So we have our first two ingredients, our sample mean, our sample standard deviation. We determine the t value corresponding to an area of 0.025 in the, with the appropriate degrees of freedom. So uh, degrees of freedom. Uh, when we're doing these types of exercises, it's just n minus 1. So in this case, it's 6 minus 1, so 5. So all of this really does for us is tell us, of all of the variants of a t distribution, which one is relevant for us. And so when we go to the t tables, you'll see it looks very similar to a z table. There's a few differences. The z table uh, is still messy with work from another problem. The Z table has lots of information about that one distribution. There's no variance of it. There's one standard normal distribution. And so we have all of these probabilities. And this is only half of it. I've got the positive side of it here too. So I've got all of these probabilities uh, to four decimal places uh, for Z values to two decimal places, right? 0 0.00, 0 0.01, 0 0.02. These are all those second decimal places, and there's the first. We have lots of information about that standard normal distribution because there's only one of them. When we look at the T distribution, now we have substantially less detail for any one uh, variant. This first column here, these are the degrees of freedom. So now this defines which variant of the distribution are we interested in. So for our problem, we had five degrees of freedom. So we can come down, and here we see five. So once we've got, once we've identified the variant of the t distribution that is relevant for our problem, nearly everything in this table is useless for us. We have just that one row of uh, t values, so that would be synonymous with the z values. You know, in the z table, we had so many of them. In the t table, all I have is maybe this is a dozen or so uh, t values, and the only probabilities that we have are right here. So again, comparing this to the z table, all of these were probabilities corresponding with a wide range of z values to the second decimal place. Lots of information. The t distribution, here I have only a dozen or so probabilities uh, corresponding to an equal number of critical values. So part of the issue with these t tables is that students often get overwhelmed. Uh, there's so much information in here, what do I do? Well, it's actually not that bad. Once you identify the variant that is relevant for your problem, you can ignore the vast majority of the information in this table. So what are we looking for here? In our exercise, I am looking for the t value that corresponds with 0.025. Well, that corresponds with, of course, the fact that we're producing a 95% confidence interval. So I want to find in that t distribution, let me scroll up here. So here's, this is now giving us an upper tail probability. Remember that the z tables were giving us the lower tail probability. 
just a slight difference that can sometimes be confusing. So if we're going to produce a 95%, that means that this is 0.25 up here, and uh, this we want is 0.025 down here. Now, another nice thing about the T distribution, uh, similar to the Z distribution, is that it is perfectly symmetric. I guess I haven't drawn it to appear perfectly symmetric, but it is. And so this T value and this T value uh, that correspond to those identical probabilities they'll be identical in absolute value. So I want to find that 95%, so 0 0.025. So what we do is I look in that first row that contains the probabilities. Here I see 0 0.025. And so coming down to our variant, our, our T distribution with five degrees of freedom, there's that critical value, 2.571. So now I can come back here, that T value with five degrees of freedom and 0.025 in the tail is equal to 2.571. Good. Calculate the limits of a 95% confidence interval for a mean. So the formula that we use is the same as if it were uh, the, from the Z distribution with just this difference that that critical value that corresponds with so many degrees of freedom and some level of confidence, uh, and the standard error, which is now denoted like this. So it's very similar looking, right? When we were working with the Z table, it was something like this. See the similarities here, right? Okay, so our limits. So we have X bar, we calculated 7.33. That margin of error now, we have that critical value is 2571 times S, which we obtained was 4.03, divided by the square root of our sample size, which is 6. And so now we can figure out those upper and lower limits. Uh, let's, let me do this in stages, actually. Let's come back over here, and let's just figure out this uh, margin of error. Uh, in an in intermediate step that might make it a little bit easier for us. So 4.03 divided by the square root of 6 uh, times 2.571. Oops. So 4.2. 4.22. Okay, that makes it a little bit easier. Two, three, okay, we'll round that. So now, I can look at my upper and lower limits. 7.33 plus 4.23, 11.56. And 7.33 minus 4.23, 3.1. So there's that confidence interval. Same interpretation, even though we're using a different T distribution, right? I'm 95% confident, 95% confident that the true unknown population mean lies somewhere. I don't know where. If I did, I wouldn't have to do this. That unknown population mean lies somewhere within those limits. Good. Okay. I hope this was helpful. Thank you so much for watching. Bye.